in the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember her. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember her. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember her. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of the sun, we will remember her. In the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember her. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember her. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember her. When we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember her. When we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember her. So long as we live, she too will live. For she is now a part of us as we remember her. We are here today to mourn for and remember Pat Horwitz. Filled with grief, we pray that her family, most importantly, and her friends and community come to find comfort and consolation from one another. For Pat's love that united so many in life and which death could never sever, for her companionship that was shared by so many along life's path and which continues now through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of her heart and mind, incredible gifts that brought such joy and happiness and wisdom and are now precious remembrances. For all these and more, we give our thanks to God. And so it is in this time of grief that we turn to voices both ancient and new as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death together. Adonai ro'i lo echsar bino deshe yar bitseni al me menuchot yena haleni nafshi yeshovev yancheni b'ma'ag le tzedek l'ma'an shamo gam ki elech b'geit salmavet lo ira ra ki ata imadi shivtecha u'mishantecha hema yena chamuni ta'aruch lifanai shulchan neged tzorarai dishanta v'ashemen roshi kosi rivaya. Ach tov v'chesed yirdfuni kol yamei chayai v'shavti b'veit Adonai l'orech yamim. Those Hebrew words are the words of the 23rd Psalm. Certainly, this Psalm is familiar as so many have said the words, its words, as a source of comfort. Of note, though, is the psalmist here expresses an attitude, a point of view that feels most fitting when we think of Pat. In particular, this notion of gratitude foundationally, appreciation, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. My cup runneth over, its most famous refrains. When we think of Pat, so much of that deep abiding sense of gratitude comes to mind. So as a sign of our presence, those of us here, those of us joining online for Pat's beloved family, in memory and in honor of Pat, Let's join in the English together. You have the words on the inside cover of the pamphlet you received when you came in. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Pat was a lover of literature, a lover of reading, a lover of Eretz Yisrael, 
in a particular moment in our history, which was sweeping for so many in their passion. And so it seemed fitting that we might include the words of an Israeli poet this day. The poet Zelda, the piece in Hebrew is called L'chol Ish Yeshem, each of us has a name. Each of us has a name given by God and given by our parents. Each of us has a name given by our stature and our smile and given by what we wear. Each of us has a name given by the stars and given by our neighbors. Each of us has a name given by our longing and given by our love. Each of us has a name given by our celebrations and given by our work. Each of us has a name given by the seasons and given by our struggles. Each of us has a name given by the stars and given by our death. And this final piece called Yesh Kochavim. There are stars up above so far away we only see their light long, long after the star itself is gone. And so it is with people that we loved. Their memories keep shining ever brightly, though their time with us is done. But the stars that light up the darkest night, these are the lights that guide us. As we live our days, these are the ways we remember. We are here, of course, this afternoon in memory of Pat and her incredibly full life. Indeed, there is no way we could capture the full depth and breadth of her 96 and a half years in the short time we have today. But we will try to offer a few highlights to honor and pay tribute to the one-of-a-kind person she was and the profound legacy she now leaves behind. Pat was born to her parents, Anne and Lewis, on October 22, 1926 at Francis Willard Hospital, the second of their two children, with her beloved big brother, Robert, having been born seven years earlier. Pat was close with her parents, in particular her father. Ask the family about a visit by her father the morning after the evening of her marriage. She has also had a deep attachment always to her brother as a child. She would tease him relentlessly, hide his cherished riding boots. And when he went off to the war, she missed him terribly. The family has the letters they wrote to one another. Tragically, Robert died in Munich in April of 1945, his death proving a terrible and enduring loss for their family. But his memory always always stayed with Pat. Growing up, Pat attended Joyce Kilmer Elementary, Eugene Field, and Sullivan High. Pat was very social. In fact, she was the social chairman of her high school sorority. Her dance card was always full, literally and figuratively. She loved to dance, especially the jitterbug. And she always wanted to keep her options open when it came to potential suitors. Evidenced in many ways, but here's one. She had a rule that no boy would be allowed to sit on her beach blanket. The closest they were allowed to come would be to stand at the edge for fear that it might give off the misimpression that she was spoken for when she was not. Of note, though, is that Pat kept a diary of sorts listing the names of all of her potential suitors and her descriptives of them and their potential. The one listing that eventually made its way to the very top was that of Marvin. Pat, still in high school, met her soon-to-be husband, five years her senior, at a dance at the Empire Room at the Palmer House. They each happened to be there with their own respective dates, so their connection did not spark initially. They met some time later on at a beach, and then the rest was really history. 
Marvin was quickly adored by Pat's parents. And though Pat adored him too, Marvin likely thought it was his shiny, fancy car that really sealed his place in Pat's heart. But it was so much more than that. The couple was married in Marvin's parents' living room by Rabbi Binstock on September 20th, 1945, marking what would become more than a half century of love and devotion. The couple lived first at the Marlboro, the building in which Ann and Lewis lived as well, where Bob named after Pat's beloved brother, and then Debbie came along. The family went back and forth to Ohio, Wright Patterson. Gordon came, finally Peter. The family settled in Highland Park and really began to set roots and grow their life there. Pat and Marvin shared a wonderful marriage and they were deeply, deeply devoted to one another. In the final year of Marvin's life, Pat cared for him unconditionally. She never left his side. As a mother, Pat was always loving and fittingly like a teacher too. Her care and presence were consistent, but Pat wasn't a hovering type of mom. It was clear to each of her children that Pat's life was big, her independent spirit was evident, and she was always out in the world doing things. She would put on plays for the PTA and at the curtain call come out in a dress that made her look like a movie star, a dress still in the family. As her children grew, Pat shared unique relationships with each of them, relationships that evolved over the years as they each grew into their own adult lives. From Debbie and Pat getting closer in particular as Debbie became a mother and later as she would care for Pat, to Gordy sharing so many academic and intellectual commonalities with his mother, they shared a deep intellectual friendship as it grew to Peter being grateful for the full circle gift of being able to care for his mother toward the end. And despite his challenges, Bob loved Pat deeply. Of some comfort is the knowledge that Pat was never aware of Bob's passing, something that had she known would have undoubtedly broken her heart. Pat was blessed to be a grandmother Grandma or Grandma Pat to her grandchildren, Audrey along with Gail, Tracy along with Andrew, Elisa and Avi, and a great grandmother to Aiden, Isabella, and most recently to Charlotte. She loved them all and thought they were, in her words, delicious. Pat was also blessed to find love again after Marvin's death with Jordan. It was Jordan's daughter Gail's suggestion to call his friend Pat to see if they would like to go to services together as they had both been widowed and had been friends as couples when Marvin and Kay were still alive. As such, spending time together with Jordan, and these are Pat's words that she shared when Jordan passed away, was just natural. The two had much in common. They paired well intellectually. Jordan felt close to Pat's family and Pat to Jordan's children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren too. They shared many wonderful times together and they really adored each other. In many ways, Pat was a person ahead of her time. Her independent spirit would have undoubtedly led her to be a university professor or something of the like had she been born into the world today. Pat was always sharp, so smart and intelligent, a good student. After graduating high school, she convinced her parents to let her attend Mundelein College. She completed two years in the early years of her marriage, but she took a hiatus as her children were growing up. And then when Peter graduated around age 40, Pat went back to Mundelein to complete her degree. She then went on to Spurtis to get an additional bachelor's degree in Hebraic studies with Judaism and Jewish education a real passion for her. Pat was a longtime member at NSCI, and more importantly, I think, a cherished teacher in our religious school, a tutor of so many of our B'nai Mitzvah students for decades. Of note also is that she tutored her granddaughters, Audrey and Tracy, for their B'nai Mitzvah. 
But Pat was not solely a teacher of Judaism for her children and others' children. She also taught adults, a renowned adult educator as a noted teacher at the JCCs of Metropolitan Chicago and especially at Don Schumann for 18 years. She taught classes ranging in topics from Jewish history to views, reviews, and interviews, as we heard yesterday when the family met. Pat was the editor for a short time of the literary magazine Story Quarterly. She served as a leader on the library board with the Brandeis Book Fair, and she was an avid reader always. She was a wonderful and devoted friend, too, to so many over the course of her life. She was known for maintaining meaningful and long-standing relationships. Is Rhoda here? One of her most cherished friends, Rhoda, one of her earliest and closest friends from when she moved to Highland Park, is here today. Indeed, there are countless many who will remember and carry Pat in their hearts for years to come. Those who knew Pat will remember her for her upbeat nature, her active and energetic soul, her love of and zest for life, how she loved celebrations and parties, travel, dressing up. We'll remember Pat for her great sense of humor and jokes, not all of which landed, but she still tried always. We'll remember Pat for her intellect, and her ability to transmit wisdom for her determination and her will. We'll remember Pat for her abiding sense of gratitude, how in reflecting on her life, she would share words of appreciation for having loved and felt loved by two wonderful men she adored, for her friends, for her family. And we will remember Pat for her devotion to all of those she loved and all of those lucky enough to have had her in her life and in theirs along the way. Zichrona Livracha, we know that Pat's memory will always abide as a blessing. We'll hear now from two of her children. First from Debbie. What are the best memories made of? The soulful memories that evoke feelings of joy, peace, love, and laughter. It's personal. Everyone has his own special memories for the ones they love. In remembering my mother, I can see her sitting on the lawn, often reading in her two favorite sunny spots, one in the front yard and one in the back. As my mother would be getting ready to go out on the weekends with my father, I can still smell the fragrance of her favorite perfume, Chanel No. 5, and I would always snuggle against her furry coat. It felt so good. I recall the excitement I felt as we headed out for a day at Riverview. It was great fun. We loved it. Um, I remember all of us going out for around the world pizza, <clears throat> a real homemade pizza that took an hour to make and was worth every minute. As we waited for the pizza, we passed the time dropping coins in the jukebox. I remember mom taking me to the first location of Anton's Fruit Ranch. There she would buy me an ice cream bar or a popsicle, depending on my preference that day. I remember spending many fun days at the beach, just as mom did with her own mother years before. I remember in the summer, just before dark, mom calling to us to come inside, and I, was, and I would always shout back, just 10 more minutes. I remember mom and I sitting on the couch in the family room in the evening, rolling freshly cleaned socks into balls, or sewing on summer camp name tags for all the kids. I remember our yearly trips to the Art Institute of Chicago 
and afterwards sitting outside in the beautiful fountain courtyard for lunch, and then buying books in the Art Institute gift shop. I remember my mother sitting on the dining room floor in front of the buffet, sorting dishes and selecting decor for another one of her many fabulous holiday celebrations. These are just some of the many wonderful, sometimes simple, sometimes grand memories that carry me back to the happy days we spent together. All of you will remember my mother in your own special way, a mother, a grandmother, family members, friend, or teacher. But I know you will always remember her great laugh and her wild and wacky sense of humor. For me, my mother was someone I could always count on for advice, a sounding board, and someone always and, and someone who always gave me comfort when I was down and cheered me on through my achievements. Mom adored and deeply loved her family. Today, we sadly say goodbye to a great woman who did her best to love us and entertain us all. Since one of my mother's favorite memories was of the beach, I chose to read a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson. It's called At the Seaside. When I was down beside the sea, a wooden spade they gave to me to dig the sandy shore. My holes were empty like a cup. In every hole, the sea came up till it could come no more. I love you, Mom. You will always be in my best thoughts and prayers. Be at peace. And say hi to our wonderful friends and family waiting for you on the other side. I send you off with all the love in my heart, waiting until we meet again. P.S. Not to worry, we will all look after each other. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was beautiful. We'll hear now from Gordon. It might have been approaching nine o'clock in the evening. <clears throat> on TV, the Phil Silver Show was just coming to an end. Once again, Sergeant Bilko had succeeded in thoroughly flummoxing his lovably gruff and clueless superior, Colonel Hall. So it was time for me to go to bed. I was five years old then, maybe six, to lighten the ease of my nightly separation from their loving presence, mom and pop hit upon a clever idea. They would themselves lift me up and carry me all the way to my room. But they did so in a delightfully unexpected way. Simultaneously, my mother took my arms, my father my legs, so that I, looking up, securely held, lay stretched out, sagging a little in the middle, yet happily swaying between the two of them like a hammock stirring in response to a summer breeze. In this manner, gently rocked from side to side and proceeded down the hall to my room. Along the way, these wonderful parents together sang an old melody, um, and maybe you know it, uh, the one that begins, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, and that ends with the hopeful, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. At last, we reached the bed, my destination. Following one last merrily, 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 and exquisitely attentive to their timing, they slowed the cadence as the song uh, of the song one last time. Life is but a dream. And precisely the sound of that one evocative word, dream, reaching my ears at that very moment, they gently let me go. And I, merrily indeed, plopped safely and softly onto the bed. 
we all burst out in laughter, me especially. There was so much of life in that and love and all of life's promise built upon my mother's and my father's playfulness and protective care. I felt so happy and so secure. And on this foundation, I have felt the imprint of this experience through all my life. How lucky we were all, how we all were, my sister and brothers and I, to be born into the world. You, mom, and you, pop, her loving husband, helped to fashion so lovingly. Four children. She cared for us equally and without qualification throughout our childhoods and into our long years of adulthood without interruption, without end. From the early days of our sojourn, from birth at Michael Reese Hospital, through childhood checkups, and in the care of the amazing, clinically talented and warm-hearted Dr. George Eisenberg. Dr. Eisenberg, our ministering angel with his magic bag of cotton balls, paper wrap, tongue depressors, and shiny stethoscope. Well, I mentioned this incomparable doctor because she found him for us and because she respected him and he her and because, thanks to mom, he became a part of that ever-widening protective circle that made our lives healthy, happy, and secure. Whenever I think of mom, I think of her friends. She had so many, and so many and each so long-lasting. The circle of her friendships constitutes a roster worthy of listings in the ancient scriptures. On or near South Deer Park alone, <clears throat> the Alchons, and I'll mention Marion, our dear neighbor whose bedroom window she could see from her own, and the Wangers and the Nathans, and the Pankos and the Penishes, the Prasants, the Plotkins and the Platts, and the Slaters, the Sangs, the Steinbergs and the Sadens, the Kirstens and the Criders and the Cantons, oh my. And among the oldest and deepest friends, in a wider circle, um, we have, of course, um, uh, the amazing Liebermans, Roberta and her, and, uh, her husband Dick, just to mention them alone, but there are so many other couples I could name by first name, and the fabulous Katzes, and in later years, the wise Kazins, and the sprightly Bernheims, the talented Diamonds, the witty Bolins, the good Pineses, and worldly Auslanders, and of course, the miraculous Lipmans. Forgive me if I have, um, as I'm sure of it, left out so many more, all a part of our home, our history, our world, our lives, all close, close friends that mom loved and shared with pop and with us. Mom was blessed with a remarkable, remarkable mind, <clears throat> which she nourished throughout her lifetime. She adored books. She found joy in learning. <clears throat> when a few years ago, I told her that due to the pandemic, <clears throat> I was now teaching online. She remembered when during a polio outbreak in the 1930s, she happily did her homework that is to say, back in the 30s, she remembered this, did her homework seated on the floor of the family apartment. As a teacher, a teacher back then, her teacher read the lessons over the radio. I loved being in school, she often said. She couldn't wait to start. When told that because her first grade birthday fell too late in the fall, she'd have to wait another six months or a year to begin her first class, she was, to say the least, distraught. But the year passed and her life in education began. That love of learning never ceased. As her memory faded, she would still look out the window of her room at sunrise, pointing to an office or a residential building across the street and ask, is that a school? Teaching, she said, has to be the best job in the world. <clears throat> as a young woman and mother, for years she attended a professional writer's group as mentioned, and studying and writing fiction was also of great interest to her. In her parents' hallway back in Rogers Park, she told me, there was a small desk where she did her studies, also there. In our lovely home in Highland Park, she also had a desk installed in the sunny niche in the bedroom. Behind that of her bedroom, behind that desk, light filtered onto her workspace from a lovely row of partially stained glass windows, their colors filtering in from behind. Blessed age before the wonders of the digital, I can still hear the crank, crank, crank as she inserted a new page into the typewriter carriage and the clack, clack, clack of the keys rising as she depressed those keys to smack against the page and roller. But wait, every now and then there would be a pause to correct a letter or a phrase and out would come the green brush headed pink rubber wheel eraser followed by a distinct sound of her sweeping and whipping away the resulting eraser crumbs followed once more by the crank, crank, crank of the carriage and to reset the paper, followed by a return to the clack, clack, clack of the keys. 
and Debbie alluded to her, her uh, sense of fashion. That was also a part of her world. Mom loved to go out, and as Debbie indicated, Saturday evenings there was perfume in the air, and uh, she was always, again, stylishly dressed. But where are you going now, I'd ask. We're going to see Flower Drum Song at the Alcyon, it might have been. And then afterwards for a nash at the Nightingale, or in later years, more modestly, still going out, those fashionable Saturday nights having given way to many modest or more modest senior get-togethers with, among others, Nalita and Fred, the Bernheims, seated in a, book, in a booth at Baker's Square, the table laden with servings of soup and turkey sandwiches and sour pickles on the side, or just slices of cream pies and on a dish and coffee, and for Pop, always, always root beer when available. A modern, a very modern woman of mid-century and long after, Mom joined her fellow young mothers behind the wheel. She drove confidently, but always safely, and she knew, I'm sure, just about as well as any seasoned explorer, every roaming twist and turn of Sheridan Road from Highland Park to Hubbard Woods, No Man's Land, and far beyond. She drove us to the doctor in Wilmette, to the dentist on First Street, to the shoe repair shop and the jewel in Ravinia, and she took us on weekday mornings to begin our day at Brayside School. Good old Brayside, best school in the world. She drove, and she drove, a captain of the road, master over succeeding epics of the yellow and white Plymouth, then the coppery tan Oldsmobile Rocket 88, the sporty Skylark, and finally the wide-bodied Jaguar. She was one of those unsung mothers who confidently at the wheel took us safely over every bump and round every corner of the then known world. And her world was big. Her travels were on occasion punctuated with zealot-like zealot -like encounters with the great and the near great figures of her time. Once in New York with Pop, she found herself in a hotel elevator all alone when, of all people, then is the then Israeli foreign minister, Abed Ibon, entered as well. Momentarily taken aback, she stared at him. The elevator failed to move. That is, until Mr. Ibon finally turned to her and asked, so, are you going to press the button? <laughs> I could add that thanks to her dad, moderately acquainted uh, with entertainers of the day passing uh, through the downtown, the downtown area in Chicago, her dad had a restaurant, um, as a girl, she was greeted and then uh, greeted by the then-famed songstress diva Sophie Tucker. On the street in her dad's company, the 40s football star and local news columnist Irv Kupsinet reached out and shook her hand. He had quite a grip, she recalled. I have mentioned that in the hallway of her apartment, a family apartment in Rogers Park, there was a desk where she studied. I should also that add that not far from that desk, she told me, was also a telephone. She loved to talk on the phone. Mr. Alexander Graham Bell could hardly have imagined how his creation could shape a life. To Western Electric, then the exclusive manufacturer of the dial telephone, she found connection to the world. As a mom, mornings began in bed with the cream-toned telephone in the bedroom cradled to her ear. Evenings and nighttime were filtered through the green telephone beside her uh, as she uh, rested and warmed the cushions of a favorite corner of the sofa in the library. She talked to her friends. She talked to her extended family. We talked. For decades, we talked on the phone about literature and politics and entertainment, too. During my college years and long after, we maintained a can't-miss appointment to talk at least once a week on Sunday evenings at 10. And into the more recent years, as the phone became ever more her lifeline to us, we spoke even more. I'd tell her about the fireflies I could see signaling to one another outside my window, all those amber-colored lights. We talked about the books I was reading with my students. We talked about the articles, touching upon new discoveries of exoplanets. She would often express the belief that there must be a reason, a primary cause for all this immensity. I was more quietly skeptical. But I think now she, maybe she was right. I'm going to keep exploring and pondering this question. And as I do so, I'll have her thoughts on the matter and her keen intuition to refer to and keep forever in mind. Two more points, and one again relating to her love of the beach. Even as her memory faded, there was one other that held, she held onto and recalled so fondly. 
I refer to her unshakable recollection of being a little girl digging and digging in the sand by the Rogers Park shore. She reminded me that at those times, her mother Anne was always nearby, keeping a loving and watchful <clears throat> eye on her. During the South Deer Park years, she so often took us to the beach in turn, whenever the kids are on the beach, were on the beach, or especially in the water, uh, she would never dare to just sit there on the blanket and read. No, it was the one exception to her love of reading. When it counted, the kids and their well-being always came first. No reading, watch the kids. Mom, you never ceased watching over us. Is there such a thing as good anxiety, good fretting, and good worry? Yes, there is. In advance of every journey, great or small, you insisted on a copy of our itinerary and asked us all to be sure to phone whenever we got to our destination, <clears throat> whether before us lay just a short drive home or a flight to the other side of the world. Now and in all future days, I am and will try to let you know where I'm going and when I'm home. <clears throat> We're home now, thanks to you and Pop, we came through all right. We're safe, we're safe, and we're as safe in your heart as we always were, and you in ours. Gordon, thank you so much for those beautiful words, your words. And Debbie's words were so filled with detail and color and life and so fitting for us, setting a, a melody really for us to remember and hold Pat with us. And we are so grateful to both of you. Thank you so much. To Debbie and to Eric, of course, to Gordon and to Lee Lynn, to Peter and to Leslie, to Audrey, Gail, Tracy and Andrew, Elisa and Avi, to the Lippman family, to all of those who hold Pat in their hearts, who will pass her memory down. We pray for you for comfort. We turn to these words from the 16th Psalm. Shiviti Adonaila Negdi Tamid Ki Mi Mini Baal Emot. I have set God before me always. God is at my side. I shall not be moved. My heart exalts, my soul rejoice. My being is secure. I am not alone. You show me the path of life. Your presence brings fullness of joy, enduring happiness is your eternal gift for us all. I'd invite you to please rise. El male rachamim, shochein bamromim. המצא מנוחה נכונה תחת כנפי השכינה. עם קדושים וטהורים כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים, נשמת פנינה בת חנה, שלך לעולמה. בעל הרחמים, יסתירי הבסתר כנפיך לעולמים, ביצור ביצור החיים את נשמתה, אדוני הוא נחלתה. תנוח שלום המשכבו. Benomar. Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Pat Horwitz, who has entered eternity. O oh God of mercy, we pray that she finds refuge in the shadow of your wings and that her soul is bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. May she always rest in peace. And we say together, Amen. Please be seated. 
seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the entombment will hand will be in just a few moments. This time we're going to ask the gentleman from the cemetery to prepare Patricia's casket for the entombment. Then everyone here can follow to the crypt, and then the rabbi will lead everybody in the mourner's cottage. Gentlemen, the shiva will continue at Chicago Jewish Funerals Chapel at 8851 Skokie Boulevard here in Skokie, and the family will be together till 7 p.m. Memorial contributions to North Shore Congregation Israel or the Spurtis Institute for Jewish Learning and Leadership would be appreciated. For those of you who are here, that information is on the service folder. For those of you who are joining us online, all that information can be found on the Funeral Homes website. This time, I just ask everyone just to take a few moments as we have beautiful violin music that Patricia loved, and then we'll, as soon as the, the casket is ready for entombment, we'll go escorted with music to the crypt. And this concludes the live stream. <laughs> 